as. That's the words I was trying to say. There is a word that makes that sound really flowery and good, but that flowery word wasn't coming to my memory. We can never use up all that God has for us. Amen. Cody, if you'll put up that first slide. I want you to see what the title of my message is today. Next one over. That was just a pretty one I put up for pretty. Thanksgiving dinner coming up next week for our church. Coming up in a week and a half for you and your homes. But have you ever thought of Thanksgiving dinner as a spiritual experience? I, I doubt that we very often look at it in that way. We look forward to the good food. We anticipate friendly conversation. Amen. We expect some labor to be involved in the preparation and in the cleaning up for sure we may even be hopeful that we can get in and out kind of quick so we can move on to other plans for the day boy it got quiet then <laughs> but when we're thinking of a meal even a church fellowship meal as a spiritual experience it's probably not a thought that runs through our minds but it should be I believe it should be that thought let me ask you this. Do you realize how often Jesus used a meal, a dinner, to accomplish spiritual goals in the kingdom of God? Let me give you, give you a, a list of some things here. Very early in Jesus' ministry, Jesus did his first miracle at a public dinner, a, a wedding celebration, a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee in John chapter 2. That miracle was, was a work of the Holy Spirit through Jesus' life as he turned the water into wine. And those who were there who witnessed it and recognized the miracle understood that it was a God moment in their lives. Now probably most of the guests who were there had no idea what was going on. But those servants who poured water into those, those those jugs, however big they were, and then when they poured it out, it was wine, knew that God had to have done that, that there was a, something happening. The disciples, Jesus, Mary, the mother of Jesus was there. They recognized it as a God moment. The, uh, the head usher, the guy who was in charge, who saw this wine, and, and, and then the, the, uh, the guest who noticed it said, wow. Most people use the good wine first, and then when people start getting a little tipsy, they start feeding them the cheap stuff. But no, you, man, you saved the best stuff for last. It was a God moment. It was a spiritual miracle to begin to proclaim who Jesus was. Twice in Jesus' ministry, he personally, by himself, fed 4,000 at one point. Matthew sh shares that story. But all four Gospels talk about Jesus feeding the 5,000. Now, I imagine that nearly everyone there recognized the miracle of that moment. They saw probably the table or the place where there was just a little bit, and suddenly he had enough to fill up this basket and this basket, and here comes another one, and he's filled that up, and, then, and there's still just as much there as when he started. He's filling up this basket, and they're going out and spread. He's filling up another basket. I believe everybody probably saw that miracle. I'm sure that they recognized it as a spiritual God moment in their lives. They saw something that no one has ever seen before. Jesus washed the disciples' feet at a meal in the upper room on the last night of his life before he, he went to the cross and used that moment to teach his disciples. As he pulled away from the meal and he knelt down at their feet, the master, the Lord. And he, he reached down and set aside his, his outer garments, and took up the towel and the water and began to wash their feet. Taught them what it was to be a servant. He'd used those words, I came not to serve or to be served, but to serve. Another time Jesus had his feet washed by a woman who came where Jesus was reclined at a table. And if you don't understand that word, 
in, in that day, in that, that area of the world, to eat a meal was not sitting in a chair at a table. There were pillows around a very low table, and they literally ate in this position leaning on a pillow maybe two or three pillows underneath them and the table out here in front of them and they ate very casually it was a very relaxed time and here is Jesus at this meal and a woman comes up behind him a woman that he had apparently had an effect on her life somewhere and she began to pour out her tears not tears of repentance not tears of sorrow she began to pour out her tears of praise and joy and thanksgiving hallelujah hallelujah I've been in those places church where the presence of the Lord was so real that the tears can't just get stopped can't get them shut off snot flowing all over my face and everything. I'm gonna just say that probably in the washing of the feet there was not only tear water there was probably a little snot boogers involved in all that too <laughs> oh no some of you just got grossed out to the max didn't you you may have to excuse yourself but there she was pouring out her heart before the Lord wetting his feet with her tears washing her washing his feet literally with with her hair the snot boogers on my feet I can deal with. It's getting my hair down and all that. That's what's bothering me just a little bit. Sharon's going to have a cow over here, I'm afraid. <laughs> but do you think that there was many at that meal that day where Jesus was reclined that didn't realize the God moment, the move of the Spirit of God that was taking place right then? Another time Jesus used the meal time to give some very important instructions at Matthew's house again very early in Jesus' ministry. Jesus has called Matthew to be one of his disciples, to be one of his followers. And Matthew throws a celebration, a, a, a reception at his house and invites all his sinner friends. Yeah, I had to drag that out to get the real preacher effect. His sinner friends. The place was full of publicans, tax collectors. And Jesus uses it as a, a time to teach again, to, to remind people about the things of God. It was again a spiritual moment in that, in that moment. At Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house, Martha is busy. She's working to get that meal ready. She's buzzing here and buzzing there. I can relate to Martha because that would have been me. I'm the guy that gets so worried about what's got to get done that I forget about the people who are there. But Mary didn't. She came and she sat down at Jesus' feet and Jesus began to talk to her. Martha gets upset. Lord, tell her. Tell her I need some help in here. I'm busy. I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off. I need some help in here. Martha. Mary's picked the part that's most important to receive spiritually, not physically. Zacchaeus' house, eating and celebrating Zacchaeus' newfound faith in Jesus Christ, teaching spiritual principles of authority and responsibility in the kingdom of God. Again, all these places, I believe there was, there was a spiritual moment in these people's lives. Something supernatural was taking place. And then a meal just before Jesus is to be crucified. Again, Jesus is at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. Lazarus has been raised from the dead. There are many other people who are there that day. The Bible says not to see Jesus so much. They came to see Lazarus. Here was a guy that had been dead, buried in the grave for three days, and now he's walking around. But Jesus is there. And Mary, that same one who had sat at his feet for teaching before, now comes before him and breaks open that alabaster vial of precious perfume and pours it upon Jesus' feet and anoints his feet with this glorious smelling perfume that fills the whole house. And she washes her, her, his feet with her hair. She worships. She worships the Lord with all that she can. What a spiritual experience I believe that was at that meal for those who would see it, who would participate. There was, there was Judas who raised up Satan at work in him. 
Satan didn't want the worship of the Lord Jesus to take place. Hey, 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 we could have taken that and spent it. We could have sold that. We could have given that money to the poor. What are you doing there? Jesus, I'm going to use what I just said. Shut your face. Huh? No, 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 no. She's done a good thing. She's anointed me for my burial. What, what a tremendous thing. Nine, nine instances that we talked about where Jesus was at a meal and something supernatural took place. Whether it was a miracle, whether it was a teaching, whether it was worship, these are spiritual things, supernatural things. Well, this Thanksgiving meal that we're going to be sharing with our community next Sunday should not just be a meal. Not just a time to satisfy the flesh and its physical and, and, and desires, even our emotional desires and relationships that we'll have. And there's nothing wrong with those things. There's nothing wrong with, with eating food. There's nothing wrong with sitting around a table of fellowship. But church, there could be so much more if we would invite the Holy Spirit to come among us at that meal. We have a, an opportunity to touch people's lives more deeply than just their bellies. Though that may be some that really need that. We can touch people's lives with the good news and the love of Jesus Christ. Let me make this very clear. And God's made it very clear to me. Let me just say this before I share that. You know, as a pastor... You may not understand this. I've never met a pastor yet that his greatest, one of his greatest desires is to see the church full. It just is. Now, sometimes it's for wrong motives. Sometimes that getting the church filled is so we can get some of this from everybody. Good job, pastor. Man, you're doing a good work there. Man, look, you're filling the house up. That's a dangerous place to get, and I'm not going to tell you I've never been there. I wouldn't lie to you like that. But that's not what it's all about. If I want the house full, it's because I want to see people being touched with the glory and the salvation and the healing and the miracles of Jesus Christ. It's not about filling our church with people, but about filling people with the love of Jesus, with the hope that we have in Him. Honoring God with our thanksgiving and praise. That's what it's all about. I want to show you one more example. I showed you nine that I found in Scripture of Jesus working at meals. There's one more in the book of Luke, chapter 14. I want to read this story to you and see the miracle, the power of God in the middle of a meal situation. Luke chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. It happened that when Jesus went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath day to eat bread. Okay, they were going for Sunday dinner together. It wasn't Sunday, it was Saturday. It was their Sabbath day, but that's what was going on. They'd been to synagogue, now they were going out and they, they, were, they were going to somebody's house for dinner. Y'all remember when we used to do that? Huh? Seldom did you go home by yourself, you went to somebody's house or they came to your house well, every Sunday after Sunday. But that's, that's what's going on. They'd come together at, on the, at the Pharisee's house, but then it says they were watching him closely. Why were they watching Jesus? Well, here's the answer. And there in front of him, in front of Jesus, was a man suffering from dropsy. Now that word dropsy is one of the most weird words in the world because every time I read it, I want to think about a guy that just passes out and faints. He's got the dropsies. <laughs> but that's not what it means at all. The drop, the word dropsy comes from a Greek word that means water because it was about fluid buildup. People who, who have swelling and retention of fluid, that's what dropsy was. And it was used, they didn't know that then, but now we know it's associated with, with heart failure, heart disease of some sort. So here's this man who's got swelling. His legs are probably, you know, maybe twice as big as they normally are. Maybe his hands, maybe in his face, swelling. Here he is in front of them. And Jesus, verse 3, answered and spoke to the lawyers. In other words, those who know the Old Testament law and the Pharisees. So these are the spiritual leaders of Jesus' day and he said to them is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? See Jesus recognized this was a setup. Mm -hmm. He recognized it was a setup. 
But they kept silent. And he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. I want to remind you that when Jesus was in Nazareth, the Bible says this, early in his ministry, and he was not able to do many miracles because of their unbelief. In other places it says, and the, 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 the presence of the Lord was there for healing. There is a difference when God is on the scene, when God the Holy Spirit is in the house, and when he's not. The Holy Spirit was there that day. Here's what I want us to know. At a meal, they're getting ready to sit down to a meal, but the Holy Spirit was present that day. Where was the Holy Spirit present? In Jesus Christ, to work through Jesus. He was present, and Jesus said to them, which one of you will have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on a Sabbath day. So you'll pull your, your donkey, your, your mule, or maybe even your son out of a well, but you want me to walk away and leave this man sick and dying? And they could make no reply. And he began speaking a parable to the invited guests. Now, before, let me say this. I, I don't think this part was Jesus making a, a speech. I think Jesus, after this all settled down, the man's healed, and I don't believe he walked out just, oh, that was nice, and walked away. I believe there was a little celebration going on when suddenly this man's swelling disappears and he gets back. But now, now things have settled down and Jesus is reclined at the table. People are starting to take their place. And as we're going to read here in a minute, people began to kind of clamor about trying to find the most important place, wherever it was at, whether it was close to Jesus or whether it was close to the Pharisee leaders, we don't know, but they begin to clamor about. And I don't think Jesus stood up and began to say anything. I think he just kind of leaned over to the guys next to him and, and this is what, what begins to take place. He began speaking a parable to invite a guest where he noticed how they'd been picking out the places of honor at the table saying to them, hey, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, don't take the place of honor. For someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by, the, by him, by the, the, the master. And he who invited you will, will both come and say to you, give your place to this man. And then in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. Can you see Jesus just kind of talking beside himself to some of who are around him? And then he goes on, but, but when you're invited, go and recline at the last place the least placed so that when the one who has invited you comes he may say to you friend hey move over here move up higher then you will have honor in the sight of all those who are at the table with you that's all common sense in my book but notice what Jesus says in verse 11 the power of the spirit was there to instruct for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted Jesus was teaching spiritual principles in the midst of this meal. Verse 12, and he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, and now he's talking to the, go, to the host, when you give a, a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return and you'll have repayment. Don't, don't invite people so that they're going to invite you back. You know, I, I'm, you know, I don't know if you've ever watched, uh, uh, it's not a very good show, I'll be very honest. Um, um, Big Bang Theory, some of you who have watched that and Sheldon on that show hates to get gifts because he has to know what the gift is so he knows exactly how much to spend to buy somebody else something. Because you, 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 know, you don't just give a gift, you get a, give a gift so you can get a gift. That's the whole, his whole premise. And that's what Jesus said. Don't do that. Don't give. Don't invite people so you can be invited. But he says in verse 13, but when you give a reception, invite the poor. The crippled, the lame, the blind, all those people were the outcasts of society. They were the people who begged on the street because there were, was no welfare system. There was no, no government aid in any way. There, was no, there were no, probably in that day, none or very few uh, charitable people, charitable uh, organizations who were there to help. No, if you, were, if you were crippled, if you were lame, you were blind, your position was out on the street corner begging. 
But he says, give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Again, spiritual teaching in the midst of this dinner. When one of those who was reclining at the table heard him say this, talking about the resurrection of the righteous, he gets all excited. Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. He's trying to make ends with the master right now. He's trying to get his two cents worth in. And Jesus said to him, a man was given a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. So, so basically what happened was someone would say, I'm going to have a big dinner. I'm going to make this big dinner. I'm going to be ready. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be making this, and we're going to have a big celebration. I'll let you know when it is. So he gets it all ready, and then he sends out his servants to go say, Okay, it's time. Come on. It's time to eat. Come on. We're ready to party. Verse 18. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. The desire for property and things of that nature. Another one said, I bought five yokes of oxen and I'm going to try them out. I bought a new truck and I've got to see how it runs. I bought a new dump truck. I've got to see if it's going to work right. I bought a new, I bought a new tractor. I'm going to go out and do some plow. See how it works. That's what he's saying. I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Taking care of business. And another one said, I have, a mar I have married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like a good excuse to me, but it's still, oh, you just got married today? You just got married today, huh? And the slave came back and reported this to his master. And the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Just what Jesus said. And the slave said, Master, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the slave, Go into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in, so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Now, Jesus was telling this parable as a picture of Israel. They were the ones that Jesus, had, that, that God the Father has said, I'm going to bless you. But when God the Father sent the Son as the blessing, when he sent the Messiah, they rejected. They were all had other things going on. They didn't want Jesus. And so he sent for us. Hallelujah. I'm the blind, the poor, the lame. Hallelujah. I'm the one out that, that, that he sent and said and compelled them to come in. Hallelujah. Church, we need to know that God wants to do something even in a dinner meal. Amen. The invitation is still being given out today. People are still finding excuse after excuse to ignore, to reject the invitation of eternal life into the kingdom of God. But we must continue to compel them to come in. Father, right now I pray, God, that you would just continue to anoint your word, that you continue to pour out your spirit. Father, open our ears to hear, Father, the things that you would say to us today. God, make us aware of the Holy Spirit and power. God, make us aware, Lord, of your presence, not just here, but even in a meal, Lord, that we're having next Sunday. God, help us to be aware that where we come in your name, there you are in our midst. Father, we pray, speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. I know you don't want to hear this, but that was my introduction. <laughs> First point, it's not all about us. As we think about this dinner next Sunday, it's not all about this. Jesus came to this meal, a meal where this food was going to be served, but he wasn't worried about the food. He wasn't worried about making an impression on the guests. His first concern was this man who had the dropsy, this man who, who was ill, who was probably so weak that he could barely get there. They had to bring him in there. Jesus was most concerned about them. He, uh, he recognized the setup. Yes, he knew what was going on. But that didn't deter him. His greatest concern was for that man. As we come into this Thanksgiving dinner, our, our greatest concern should not be the food. 
I'm not saying we don't think about it, we don't do our best, with it, but that shouldn't be our greatest concern. It shouldn't be what time we start or what time we get on. It shouldn't be, well, I, I need to get out of here. I got something to do today. I've got, I just married a wife and I've got to go be with her. I just uh, bought a tractor. I've got to go try it out or whatever the excuse may be. We need to be coming with a plan and a purpose that is God's. Amen? Whether it's our friends, our family, our neighbors, or whether it's complete strangers. Huh? We're there for them. This is our opportunity to serve others. To give back. You know, God has blessed us. Think about it, church. I, I, I don't know if you realize this. Maybe most of you don't. Nicole does. She writes the checks. We wrote a check for nearly 70000 Actually, a little over altogether, a little over $70,000 to have this parking lot paid this year. $70,000. I don't know about you, but that's not just easy for me to pull out of my back pocket. But guess what? God supplied, and we're still blessed with an abundance. We're still blessed with an abundance. Our God is able in every situation. So we don't need to worry about those things. We need to give back to God out of the abundance that he's given to us. Jesus said this in Matthew 25, 40, 40 Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of the, these brothers of mine, even the least of them you did it to me. Do you remember that story? He's judging between the goats and the sheep and, and he talks about you, you, you gave me food when I was hungry. You visited me when I was in prison. You gave me water you gave me clothing when I was naked Jesus talks about all these different things he says when you do it to one of the least of these out here in the world you've done it unto me when we're serving at a Thanksgiving meal or wherever it may be it's not about about us it's about serving them serving the Lord Jesus Christ and serving them Jesus said, I did not, I've quoted this a while ago, Jesus told them, I did not come to be served, but to, be, to serve. Let me tell you this, if Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, came to serve, how much more should you and I be ready to serve? This is our opportunity to touch lives. Simple kindness, friendship. You know, Jesus built relationships around tables, around meals. He did miracles around tables. He demonstrated the power of God, the authority of God, through teaching around a meal table. So let's remember, it's not about us next Sunday. Church, I'm telling you, this is the guy in front of you that will worry about us more than anybody else. I'm a task guy. I, I'm telling you, I, sometimes when it's all over, I look at myself and I say, Cole Baker, what were you thinking? Twice in the last year, I've went over to Appleton City, which is over on the other side of 79. There's a new church being put in, new church being established, pastors putting in a church there. And I've went over there to help just do some construction work. Well, I'm there. I've got my tools. I'm there to work. And what's the pastor want to do? He wants to chat. He's telling me his dreams. He's telling me his goals. And I'm just chomping at the bit. I'm just, I, okay, that's all well and good. But we got sheetrock to hang. Let's start hanging sheetrock. You know, I've got, we got plumbing to do. Let's start putting in some plumbing, whatever it is. And God keeps scolding me. He says, boy, maybe you just need to learn to listen and quit worrying about all the work. Just listen. It's not about us. It's not about us. We need to keep our focus and our minds in the right place. But what might Jesus be a, a planning to accomplish at this dinner? If he walked into a Pharisee's house and heals a man of sickness and disease, what might God be wanting to do at this dinner? Do you think God might have a plan? Is your faith big enough to believe for it? Lord, we believe for it. Is your faith big enough? Is your faith big enough to believe that, that God would bring people in from our community, people that you invite, because he has a purpose in their being here next week? Who knows what God might have in store for us? Maybe in the way of relationships, establishing new relationships in our lives, people that we can touch and influence, or maybe people who can touch and influence us sometimes, huh? Maybe it's about some instruction that needs to be given where we can speak the wisdom, the knowledge, the truth of God into someone's life. Or maybe 
someone could speak the truth, the knowledge, and the wisdom of God into our lives. Maybe it'd be an opportunity for a miracle to take place as you sit down beside someone and they begin to share a situation in their lives and your faith rises up and you just say, can I pray for you? And you lay hands upon them and pray and maybe something miraculous happens right there or maybe you find out a week from now that, that because of that prayer something happened. God can set up appointments, spiritual appointments just like this if we'll be aware. Maybe it'd be an opportunity to share with somebody the mighty work of God in your life or someone to share with you the mighty work of God in their life. To encourage, to build up, to be a witness, to win somebody to Christ. It's not about us. It's about God's plans, God's purposes for His church in this world that we live in. I'm asking you, will you be open to the leadership of the Holy Spirit? Will you come in next Sunday morning, next Sunday afternoon and say, God, what do you want to do here today? Will you be available? Thirdly, we must be led by the Holy Spirit in order to accomplish what the Holy Spirit wants to accomplish. When I say Jesus saw the setup, in my mind, I believe that probably Jesus knew what was going to take place at that meal before he got there. I believe in private place of prayer, the Holy Spirit had already said, you need to be ready. <laughs> you need to get ready. They're setting you up today. I believe that many times... Jesus spent a lot of time in prayer and preparation for every encounter. He kept himself sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say something you may have heard, you may have never heard this before, but Jesus practiced the presence of God. That may sound odd to you, but Jesus practiced being in the presence of God. We need to practice that in our private prayer closet when we're by ourselves. Being alone and sensing and knowing the presence of God. So that when, the, when that moment arises and we, the presence of the Spirit is there, we recognize this. If Jesus had to spend time in prayer and in fellowship with God, how much more do you and I need to spend time in God's presence? We must learn how to listen to the voice of God in our quiet place so that we'll recognize His voice in the noise of our daily lives. Let me say that one more time. We must learn how to listen to the voice of God in a quiet place so that we will recognize His voice in the noise of our busy lives. If you can't hear the voice of God in a pr private place of prayer, of seeking His face, I promise you when you're out there and, and the hustle and bustle and things going on, you're going to struggle to hear the voice of God in that place. We need to be people who practice the powerful presence of God in a place of aloneness. Aloneness with God so that we'll be able to experience the power of His presence when we're ministering to others. Hallelujah. The Holy Spirit wants to lead us into powerful opportunities to touch people's lives. I believe that. And too often we, I miss them because I'm too focused on the task. God forgive me. I'm telling you, it's my biggest struggle. I'm so task oriented. I'm like a horse with blinders on. Don't get in my way. This is what I'm doing. Some of you have probably experienced that. You come into the kitchen down there and you've come to help and Pastor Mike's got his and I'm, Maybe you need to just walk. No, I almost said that. Mm -mm. Walk up and slap me a little bit. No, don't do that. <laughs> but how many unexpected meetings